Well, welcome along to this uh, sports event summit, and we're looking at sports events and tourism, the American landscape. And joining us today, our guests uh, for this panel, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Al Kidd, and Al is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Sports ETA, Sports Events and Tourism Association. Uh, also with us today, uh, we have Lise Abili, and Lise is the Director of Sports Development at the Florida Sports Foundation. Uh, Terry Hasseltine is with us as well. Terry is the Executive Director of Maryland Sports. Uh, Tim Ramsberger joins us. Tim is the Chief Operating Officer uh, for Visit St. Petersburg uh, Clearwater. So, Welcome to you all, uh, gentlemen. It's been a, a difficult year for everybody. Just on um, alphabetical order of first names, Al, we'll, we'll start with you. Give us a bit of an overview, if you would, of uh, what the situation is in the States, in the United States post-COVID. It's been a, a difficult and challenging year for everyone, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been, uh, I'm not sure we're quite post-COVID yet, but, um, you know, it's, it caught a lot of people off guard uh, with all the intelligent people we have in the industry and tourism. Uh, obviously, this uh, gains speed faster and deeper and wider than anybody thought, and uh, both on a global as well as across the, all the spectrum of the United States. And when we, we first started out in the space, we, we, I determined I'm a marketing person and, uh, historically, and that's what I did for a vocation before taking this, this uh, hobby job that I have. Um, you know, there are three phases of this. Uh, one was kind of the, oh my gosh, what, what happened? And people were in a panic and uh, they were trying to determine, you know, their financing. All of a sudden they're driving with the zero with the hotel stays because about 94% of our industry is funded on hotel stays. And so then the second thing was kind of uh, reinvigorating and that's when we went to work hard and aggregated content to provide to people. And that reinvigoration period, uh, Andrew, was really centered on professional development. Um, and we did uh, launch a couple of virtual events in the test of that process, and it, it, it served us well. And now we're in kind of the, the relaunch phase, which is going to continue for a couple of years. And relaunching is uh, is uh, is kind of a staggering situation because here in the United States, our legislation does not allow federal kind of rulings over the states. And so each state is on its own, and that's created a bunch of uh, confusion. And I, I may get into it later if we, we continue this part of the conversation, but I don't want to dominate the beginning, but it was kind of the... The beginning, oh my gosh, the, a little bit of a resurgence and now the relaunch and we're a relaunch and there's just a variety of things that are going to take place um, during this uh, pre and post and during the vaccination process. Mm. Thanks, Sal, for, for starting us off. Uh, Lisa, I mean, if you're representing Florida, really, in the Florida Sports Foundation. Um, how have things affected you um, in, in that state? Um, Thanks very much, uh, Andrew, and thank you everyone for being uh, for being on this. Obviously, um, and Tim will probably uh, share this with me at some point as well uh, in, in in his thoughts about um, the state of COVID and what we've all been through. Obviously, like I mentioned, I'm not going to dive much into that, but this took everyone by surprise. You know, it was uh, it was quite uh, kind of a sudden death that for those that are a little familiar with uh, with with soccer and that post penalty rule that came out sometimes in the in the late 90s, but um. We, um, we, 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 we did uh, brace ourselves and, uh, and got straight into it and started uh, in our different communities. And just a little bit how we are set up in the state of Florida. It might be a little different from, uh, from other places uh, like, like Terrace in Maryland and, 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 and so on. But um, our different communities do react differently and they reacted differently, but all towards the same objective about you know, how to uh, uh, go how to uh, tackle this that this current situation when it occurred from a state standpoint you know we observed that a lot of events started uh postponing or canceling starting the month of march uh, but uh the governor's office through an executive order reopened the state again sometime down in uh, in june we we had uh, an event at our at AAA, uh, uh uh here in in, in Brevard county which was a baseball a new baseball event that was Kind of like the first open event, in, you know, AAU followed suit with some um, uh, volleyball indoor events and so on. So that kind of like was the rebirth of, um, of events back in the state. And since then, obviously, you know, all these events uh, came back into the state with, you know, some national guidelines, you know, CDC guidelines as well as state guidelines, sometimes even county and city guidelines on, on COVID and COVID protocols and how these events need to um, uh, to operate in within within the state and within that community. 
Um, like I said, most of these events, some of them were, were postponed later down to the fall. Some of them took place in the fall, and so on. So it was it's it was a very challenging moment. But I think the undertone to everything here that um, despite the drop in sports tourism during that period, um, the state of Florida um, still kind of like you know uh, maintained some um, level of you know of of, of sports. You know um, we currently in a situation where, yes, there was some loss, obviously, in terms of, you know, bed night and, 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 and hotel tax and all of that. But for the most part, following starting June, July, August, and down to this point right now, there's been some kind of a recovery. Obviously, no one is going to be at 100%, but uh, we're very fortunate that most of our events took place. And, you know, one of the biggest things that happened is, you know, the Central Florida, Orlando did benefit from what was called as the bubble. The NBA, you know, had the playoffs in Orlando, Major League Soccer, a welcome back uh, tournament in Orlando, which was kind of like a good boost for us here in the state. And obviously, the Lightning uh, won the uh, the Stanley Cup. So that was uh, definitely uh, a good scenario for us. So all in all, we are looking good and we're hoping that 2021 is going to be that ton of fun. That has been the case globally, hasn't it? That some cities, some states, some uh, regions have benefited whilst others have been perhaps in more of a complete lockdown where they've been able to do um, bubbles. Terry, if we come to you next, if we may, uh, from Maryland, and uh, obviously sport is massive in Baltimore in particular, but, but how has it impacted um, on Maryland? Because I think people have looked to sport across the world to give them some sort of hope and respite during uh, during 2020 haven't they i mean I think the us and, uh, and and europe in general they've looked at sport to give them some idea of uh, of coming out of this yeah no in maryland we've been um, we've been blessed by the leadership of uh, governor larry hogan who was the chair of the the governor's association during the onset of of covid um so we we're you know blessed from that perspective we've you know faced a lot of the challenges you know that others have faced um with having to close the doors and then, you know, going to bring leadership together to create a strategic um, return to play plan that met all the standards and the like. But I go back and I think I'll take a little different approach to answering this question. There is a silver lining to all this. And the silver lining for us is that in the state of Maryland and probably nationally and even internationally, the chain and the levels of communication have become um, such door openers um people that we didn't talk to um probably on a regular basis now are becoming a fabric of our equation you know talking with the health community talking with our pro sports down to our amateur sports to our collegiate sports there's an intertwining conversation because there's a commonality now amongst all of them um, the commonality is we're all trying to get sports back on the field of play back on the ice back on the courts whatever sport it might be or back in the water but you know, now you got sports, you know, at all levels communicating up and down the chain of communication, integrating, you know, agencies that we might not have touched um, on a regular basis, Homeland Security, the health departments, you know, you know, public safety initiatives and the like. So the silver lining in all this is that I think it created a new network of communication and a new trail of leadership. So when we start looking at events coming back online, you know, we don't have to reinvent any new wheels now. We have covered our bases. Uh, we learned a lesson, you know, in our country's history back after 9-11, uh, which opened the door to a, a certain level of safety and um, security, you know, protocols that are now involved with most sports events at all levels. Now we have the health aspect put into the into play, and you put those things all together. Now we're working with a well-oiled machine about how we're going to bring sports back, how we're going to bring fans back, and how we're going to engage the sponsorship levels and the like, because you know, we're in a new environment now and it's kind of done a little reset, but it's also opened a door that really makes um, me really excited about the future of sport tourism, sports events as a whole, because now we got a much bigger team to play with to execute opportunities. So if there's a silver line to COVID is that the fact that the lines of communication have opened significantly, it's allowed us to think and plan, um, I think a little bit deeper than we normally would because we're always going at a thousand miles an hour the next events on the radar and the next and the next it's allowed to sit back a little bit on our large-scale events about key strategies or got key opportunities and how we bring everybody into the fold to make sure that legacies are important how we're bringing sustainability and other very significant matters 
and then how will we bring in social um, matters like you know, social justice program initiatives that are out there. So the silver lining is it's opened the door to a lot of conversations that didn't exist probably prior to COVID. And we'll explore some more of those um, positive outcomes, if you like, from uh, from what's happened during 2020, because there are lots. Tim, from, from your point of view as the uh, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Visit St. Petersburg, perhaps operating at a more local level than some of the guys that are representing states and, and, and uh, nationally as well. Um, what's What's been the sort of the impact for you? Have you still been able to continue in some areas or has it been like a total shutdown for you? Not, not a total shutdown. We have been able to host certain events, as you know, you know, compared to the rest of the country. You know, the, the, the first wave in the spring came to us last year in the south. Um, we, we are under increasing pressure with the rise in cases here in the state of Florida that it's a, once again uh, for those events that have either remained open uh, um, or at least on the books for still uh, uh, in the future. There's a lot of pressure. The events are starting to uh, the trend is shutting down again. Um, I, I think to put some context of who we are, we're, we are a sports commission within the DMO of Pinellas County. So we are a government agency. So we collect 100% of the bed tax. And so we're funded through bed tax. And as a leisure destination, we've done okay in, in the pandemic um, due to strong drive markets here, not only in the state of Florida, but up into Georgia and the Carolinas. So we we have not been impacted as severely, I would say, as the rest of the state of Florida, if, if that's an appropriate comp set. So as a result, with our sports programming, you know, we are still impacted, probably lost about 50 to 60 percent of our events um, this current year. And again, that's still trending uh, toward the negative right now. And so, you know, from an economic impact standpoint, it, it's been about a 50 percent hit to us. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, we were doing great. Uh, you know, when this hit, now I think um, coming out of it, uh, it's going to be a question of new strategies and new execution. We have 24 municipalities in Pinellas County uh, and through their parks and recs departments mainly that run these facilities. You know, we are a lifeline to help them with funding events and funding programs. And so um, our role is a, is a critical one right now to make sure that we're doing all the right things to help continue to promote the destination in such a way as to make sure that people understand it's a safe environment here. And I think that's really key to match up with consumer sentiment right now that people still want to have their kids participate. Uh, they still want to travel to some degree, but they want to know it's safe. And so we've undertaken a real big campaign here in Pinellas County to make sure that um, you know we're a safe destination here and that people can feel comfortable coming here. But, you know, sports is, uh, if anything, a resilient industry. And I agree with what the other panelists have said that, you know, we will come out of this at some point. I, I think it will be a different um, landscape. It's, uh, this is not just disruption. This is, I think, a, a game changer. And so we're trying to figure out ways to be innovative in the, in the uh, post-COVID era, uh, coming in the, out of the recovery. And I think it's gonna take partnerships at the national level and at the state level. And Lise knows that with the Florida Sports Foundation, they've done a good job of, of tweaking their funding models for state uh, sports commissions to allow for a little bit leniency on in-state uh, numbers rather than looking at entirely uh, out of state for visitation. So um, again, I think it's, um, and as Terry said, and, and Al, that it's opening up all sorts of lines of communications that you never had before. So best practices are, I, I think, being elevated all over. Um, so I think, again, if uh, to, I think Terry mentioned the silver lining, yeah, I, I do think there will be good that comes out of this long term, but it's, it's going to be painful getting there. Thank you, Tim. I mean, I'll come to you. Uh, does it feel like a new start then? Does it feel like that you're looking at new ways of uh, operating or, or what have you been able to, uh, to retain from if we skip back a year? Um, because there's some massive events coming up, aren't there? There's always a huge number of events on the US calendar. But in terms of the, the global picture, an Olympic year and, and America always does well in hosting nations that want to use training camps in America. The, the, the lack of flow of people across the world must surely have had a, a big impact on the, on the events and tourism for you. Yeah, on a on a national basis, that that's absolutely true. And, and Terry and I spent a lot of time working on the international front with a lot of organizations, the Alphabet Soup of international organizations. And 
you know, it's very common and consistent around the world. There is a changing dynamic of the economic funding for sports internationally, which has always been different than the U.S., but getting closer to the way that the U.S. does it, which isn't necessarily right, just the way the U.S. does it. But Terry's made a couple of good points uh, in terms of the silver lining. We, too, as a national association, it's been a silver lining for us. We've had time to launch and re reinvigorate everything we do on a national front from a relevancy standpoint. And form some communities and organizations and Terry heads up one on the state sports uh, tourism association. It's made some great strides in terms of communication and those communication links uh, that Terry talked about. Um, we as a national uh, entity in terms of sports events and tourism has really gained a foothold in terms of national relevancy and all the DMOs who kind of gave it lip service in the past now realize the importance of it. Now, I'm not saying it's going to lead anything. I, I get frustrated with people saying sports is leading. I'm not sure what it's leading. But I can tell you leisure activity right now is number one by far. But when, when things come back and we're able to do activities and events, sports will play its role in some places more significant than others, but it will play a, a role. And there are permanent changes coming. I mean, if you, do, if you study the research on what's happening with the feeder system, which is our youth programming, there's a significant drop off of kids wanting to continue participation when it comes back. That has a lag effect on where we're going to be five and eight and 10 years from now that people are not considering the permanency of that impact that Tim talks about permanent changes. We're also looking at widening the definition of success. Uh, Lisa, Lisa mentioned uh, uh, resident sentiment. We are driving resident sentiment as a major contributor to a community's asset base around what sporting events do, like no other. And that change will be permanent. Um, Diversification of income, I think your DMOs are finding they, they were caught uh, uh, really not necessarily paying attention to the business the last eight years. When you got a hockey stick of growth, you can hire any salesperson, you're going to get sales. And so there's so many of those kinds of things, Andrew, that we could spend uh, quite a bit of time just talking about each of those as a singular element. I've got a list of about 20 things changing, but Terry knows a lot about this because we speak more often. Tim and I talk periodically. We work at Lise's group often. But there are permanent changes coming. One is going to be the feeder system in sports. The second is how youth sports are governed across the United States from the from the youth sports participation. How many of those uh, independent cottage industries are going to stay in business? Uh, the national governing bodies at the at the amateur level, the USOPC and NCAA are going to go through a sea change over the next five years. All that will have a long term effect on professional sports and events coming in and um, we're going to be driving, Terry and I are spending time on a couple of these international groups, as I mentioned, we're going to be driving how that integrates back into the U.S., but uh, with some of the great work that Terry's doing in Baltimore, uh, you like that, Terry, I said Baltimore, you know, how you guys yeah, say it? Yeah, there you go, good job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what they're doing for the World Cup is, is spectacular, and a lot of our people across the country are doing things around the World Cup, uh, and, you know, Terry, I hope I have a chance to be able to talk about what they're doing, but you know, really a good content, a, a discussion is is the permanent changes. And again, I've got a whole list of others, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Okay, well, no, feel free, because I, I, I know that your knowledge is uh, is, is in-depth. But Terry, um, I'll kick us off there with a few changes. Um, what other changes do you see as, as leaving a permanent mark on the uh, on the U.S. landscape that, that will result from this? Well, I mean... The, uh, the the unique challenge I think that you know was mentioned by several of the panelists is that you know how the doors will open to uh, traveling you know not just domestically but traveling abroad uh, what some of those new protocols and it will look like for you know just a general casual you know traveler as well as those who are coming in you know for specific sport you know whether it's the spectator whether it's to participate. You know, so how we assess and evaluate the future traveler into uh, to our markets. Um, I think the identity, and I, I think Tim mentioned it, Al mentioned it, Lisa mentioned it, is that how we look at the, the local markets, you know, and what's going on at the, the youth and the grassroots level in, in comparison to what's going on at the collegiate and pro level. Um, I think we'll, you know, take on some cultural differences about how we deliver sports in our own markets and how we then get to account for them. Um, because I think regionalization for a while will be back in play. People are going to get a lot more comfortable with, you know, getting in the car again and traveling in and around the region before they start jumping on you know, airplanes again. So there's going to be this 
growth scale, almost like we've almost reinvented the industry a little bit, where it starts with the car and the van and then the SUVs, and then it's going to lead into, you know, getting on buses again and then getting onto airplanes again. And it's kind of like learning how to walk again in some some cases because there's going to be that you know insecurity that's out there for a lot of people, even though the vaccine is coming into the market. Um, there's still a lot of people who don't, you know, know all the details. Is you know we're dealing with a time where a vaccine was generated, you know, in less than 18 months, first time in world history that that's kind of you know happened, and you know people are like you know a little skeptical. Is it you know good for a year, good for two years? You know, so a lot of um, uncertainty still to to remain in the market. You know, however, I think you know the plus side is you know going back to some of the previous conversations that we can reinvent some things and we can put some new um, you know, initiatives into play. I mean, just look at right now, esports, you know, as I can tell you, I know about this much in esports, but I'm learning, you know, a little bit more each day. But, you know, there's there's a market that's starting to really, you know, take off because of COVID, um, because of the way it can be played and participated, you know, and, and then also now looking at some of the programs about how they will expand travel and become uh, a significant player. You got, you know, the HBCU institutions creating esport leagues. You got, you know, you know, the high schools putting in esport leagues, you know, and you're seeing this big predominance of uh, esports and, you know, sponsors looking to esports because of the digital platform of it and how you can expose. So there's going to be some sports in our market that will probably see, a, a, like I was mentioning, a decline in participation because right now, I mean, just look at the United States, you can't find a bike in the United States because during this time period, people were looking for extracurricular activities to keep themselves out and about and cycling became huge. Well, what are we hosting next year? The Maryland Cycling Classic, which is, um, you know, the only pro series cycling event in the United States in 2021. However, it's also got a grassroots component to it, a, a, a charitable component to it, all around the sport of cycling. And who knew a year ago that cycling would become this core, you know, participatory activity because of COVID? Well, we happen to be in all fairness ahead of the curve because we're already pursuing that activity in that event. But, you know, we have a huge opportunity there on a sport that has picked up in its interests across you know, the U.S. and internationally and, and the like. And Al mentioned the World Cup. I mean, how we're going about the World Cup and getting prepared for it for 2026 and working with FIFA and the U.S. Soccer Federation, you know, because of time, we've now been able to create a different landscape about how we're presenting our model, how we're presenting our case, you know, what's relevant, what's important for the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland as it pertains to the, you know, our World Club deliverables between legacy and development projects, how we're integrating kids into the game, how we're gonna look at, you know, growing the sport and the visibility of it in our market. If, in all fairness, if we didn't have this little hiatus in sports, we would have probably just gone at it as we normally would have gone at it. But, you know, there's gonna be some big changes um, in the way people perceive and, and approach things. And um, in all fairness, and I think, you know, Al in his, you know, just on his voice, the, the excitement of how we're gonna engage with the national, you know, with Sports ETA and how we're gonna engage with some of the international organizations and the like and our partners across the country. So we can create some similarities and commonalities. You know, I think that's the other pro that has come out of this is that we're all looking for methodologies that can best serve all of us because you know we can no longer live in our little isolated boxes and protect our our territory. Because if we don't communicate, we're going to go right back into um, a, a space in which it's us versus them, and it needs to be us with us. Um, it needs to be a win-win proposition nationally and internationally in our approach. And you know, the lines of communication, as I mentioned earlier, I think are going to be so critical. And I thank Al um, for what he's doing at Sport ETA to you to open some of those channels. I appreciate what you're doing, Andrew, and giving us these platforms to to really talk about some of these, you know, changes and these developments that are transpiring and, you know, allowing us the opportunity to showcase that we really have so much in common. And now we have these vehicles to talk about the commonalities versus the, the competitive nature. Um, and I look forward to um, the conversation as we expand on these, these, these matters. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Lisa, just, just talking about the, the Florida experience, you've mentioned uh, a lot of events there that have still been able to happen. And of course, a, a double header with Super Bowl, if you like, from uh, from, from February and, and, and hopefully uh, looking ahead. I mean, is there any clarification on whether Super Bowl next year will, will go ahead in uh, in Tampa? Is any decision made on that as yet? Yeah, yeah. The uh, As of right now, you know, um, I'm not, I, 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 I uh, 
there's no uh, information about canceling to the bowl or anything of that sort. So currently, uh, plans are underway uh, for that to happen. And I think, uh, in my opinion, I think it's going to happen probably with a lot of restrictions. Obviously, we um, we've seen that the, the NFL has successful has successfully been pulling um, their uh, their season together, which is a great uh, glimpse of hope about um, the Super Bowl. You know, Tampa has been preparing uh, we, the Florida Sports Foundation, together with uh, the Tampa Bay uh, Sports Commissions and obviously uh, all other partners, you know, surrounding the organizing of the Super Bowl have been putting in the work, have been putting in the time. Um, so this time, I would say that positively, uh, it's it's gearing up to, to happen. And not only that, but also uh, a few other uh, major events around uh, across the state as well, which would be uh, which would be coming forward. But I did want to just also quickly, uh, um, Andrew, if you permit me, I know Terry and Al, and to some extent, um, Tim did say this. You know, one of the things which we've done also in the state to adjust to, to all of this is being able to 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 adjust our grant uh, our grant program. You know, in the state of Florida, we have state funding, which you know uh, partners with who are local destinations like uh, like Saint this is Saint Pete Clearwater. You know, do qualify to apply for for such funding to offset some of the costs for events to bring into their community. So what we did, it was based, it was mostly based on out of state economic impact. You know, like Terry said, part of this. Part of the challenges of COVID is, you know, you're not really going to see people jump on planes and fly to, to, you know, to different states to play events. So it's going to start from, you know, a regional kind of recovery in terms of, you know, they're going to get on the get in the car, drive down some hours, you know, four or five hours somewhere, and you know, it starts within the state. So we decided to adjust a little bit to open up a program to not accommodate in-state, uh, in-state day and day visitor, you know, impact, and that definitely. We made most, most regional events, smaller events qualify for funding, which otherwise would, would not have. And of course, the biggest takeaway, and I keep saying this, is one of my biggest takeaway from all of COVID and a part of the silver lining is, hey, isn't everyone now conscious uh, or a little more conscious about personal hygiene? <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest things, right? Every time you find yourself not washing your hands, you know, hand sanitizing your hands, every time, sometimes even unconsciously. But, um, there's that there are literally there are a few things like that. But otherwise, you know, we, we continue in the state to look at those opportunities uh, about landing some of the big events and obviously very healthy company. Terry will testify to that in the city of Orlando, Jason Siegel, the the, uh, the 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 CEO of Greater Orlando Sports Commission, you know, Jose Solando Solango, the executive uh, director of the uh, Greater Miami Sports Commission. Uh, we also, you know, working like Terry is doing, everyone in their own style to be able to prepare, and, you know, and, and, and get bids for the FIFA World Cup 2020. Obviously, if we are fortunate enough that, you know, we land events here in Orlando and in Miami, uh, that's, that's a huge event. The spread of the impact of that event goes beyond these two destinations. Terry, from a state standpoint, probably understand. Uh, what that is, you know, you know, it's not not only would this is declare water also benefit from you know from that, but also all other you know surrounding cities around the main city where that's going to happen. So that's um, that's kind of how uh, most of this is looking. Uh, Orlando so just got awarded, you know, the um, uh, the all events for the Conquer Cap at, at, at Champions League. Uh, so this event is going to, rather than where it was supposed to be spread out, it's going to move to uh, um, to Orlando at the Explorer Stadium uh, here. So uh, we continue to push and and be positive about some of these major events happening throughout the state. Lisa, thank you for that. I mean, you, you've touched on, obviously, the sports side. Tim, from your point of view, just in terms of looking at sports tourism, um, and and obviously Florida in particular is, is a huge attraction to people not just within the states but but globally but as we've mentioned there Terry first touched on it I think the the problems for the aviation industry um, you know it, it, it lacking or losing that ability if you like to attract people from around the world uh, albeit temporarily we hope 
Um, yeah. Has that had a major impact on the uh, on the landscape in terms of finance? You were mentioning about the bed tax funding most of what you do, but has th has there been an impact from the the loss of, uh, of global trade in in sports tourism? Mm -hmm. Um, not not so much for our destination. I would say yes, obviously around uh, the country, around the state, um, and it's something we were looking forward to coming and joining Nigel and the group um, this past summer uh, for the International Sports Convention in uh, in London, uh, because we do have aspirations uh, on a long term basis to try to leverage those things like the World Cup in '26 um, in LA in '28. I'm a I'm an alum of the '94 uh, World Cup, having run helped. Uh, run the Orlando venue for the World Cup and the Olympic Games in Atlanta. So I understand, you know, what teams would be looking for. When I was at Disney's Wild World of Sports, Mike Malay and I actually cut a deal with the British Olympic Association um, to be the warm weather training facility for the BOA. I think there are going to be opportunities like that. You're going to start saying that. And, and as we were ramping up for the World Cup in 94, there was facilities like Austin Tyndall and Seminole County that were building their facilities around the fact that they wanted to be a training site for one of the teams because they know that what they would mean long term to be able to springboard business discussions and whatnot. So it's um, it's definitely part of the long term vision. And I think what's the biggest challenge, and I think Terry hit on it, you know, right now it's about funding. It's mm -hmm. about where are we going to find dollars to support what we need to support. We can no longer support everything that we used to. And so business principles, I think, become heightened again. You have to look for that ROI. You have to really be able to distinguish which, which events are more meaningful for you to put money behind to support. Um, I'm a big advocate of continuing to invest, but you've got to invest smartly, whether that's supporting events or facilities. And uh, we have a, a discussion going on in our county right now about the potential of, uh, of building a, a, a sports facility that's dedicated 100% to third-party programming rather than recreational or citizen use. Because it, the tension right now that we have is sometimes, uh, you know, not having facilities available to us because they're they're dedicated to team, uh, local sports uh, uh, groups or or residents. But continuing to invest in, in in events, I think, is key for for any destination. Um, but again, I think on that short term versus long term, these these business principles um, for us, uh, we have kind of a basic uh, evaluation of, you know, what is the direct impact of an event coming in? And, and this is no different than what Al and Lise and Terry can tell you. You know, there's that direct economic impact. There's got to be a threshold uh, level of direct impact or else it's a non-starter because that's what generates bed tax in our case that funds these. Um, then obviously the marketing and promotional value. And again, being a, a world-known uh, uh, dest leisure destination, business in Clearwater, you know, promoting our beaches and and that, that's exactly in our wheelhouse. So we look at marketing promotional value um, as importantly as direct economic impact. But there's that third element, which is, you know, what does it mean to the community? Uh, what does it mean sort of culturally? Because I think uh, I, I've adopted this phrase. I'm stealing it from some unknown person who wrote it one time that that you know, sports is a community's cultural currency. Mm -hmm. And you've got to continue to understand how to leverage that currency and use it wisely. So I, again, I think things like the Super Bowl here, we're a partner with our neighbors in Tampa. We're helping fund the event because again, even though we know that we're not gonna have the same, probably not have the same level of attendees, uh, corporations have even said that they're scaling way back because of the pandemic, it's all understandable. But it still doesn't mean that we don't try to invest in what that promotional value means for us and also for the long term because we know the NFL is going to want to come back here someday. And again, we're going to be able to step up. So, again, things like the World Cup in 26 and L.A. 28, we're, we're trying to figure out ways of being in that international discussion for teams that want to come through here and train, maybe create our own events. And so, uh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I think this is going to be an opportunity to re-strategize and be smart about, you know, what we fund and how we fund things. Tim, thank you. And we, we've spent half the session 
perhaps quite rightly, I think, looking at the landscape as it is at the moment, but we've got a very good picture from you all of, of what the state of play is. But to our looking ahead and perhaps looking positively at innovations and uh, some of the things that Tim was uh, in particular was alluding to there, where do you see um, the need to focus now go, going ahead if, in terms of your organisation in particular, but you know, driving sports, tourism and events? Um, where, where do we need to focus going forward, do you think? Yeah, that's, um, you know, I, I often uh, tell people I gave my crystal ball up a long time ago, but I'll take a good shot at it. Um, you know, w w we work at the intersection of community and commerce, uh, frankly, and uh, the result of that is all the, the measurement tools that have been discussed here in terms of, you know, deciding how you look at an event coming into a, to a location. There, there's no denying that the financial implication of the hotel stays is, is a big part of it, but that's, it's not the only part. You know, how it affects your community and how it affects the, the, the ability for your community to recruit people to come in from an employment standpoint where their kids are going to participate in the youth sports programs or the recreational programs in that community. You know, how much earned media do you gain? You know, what is the social and digital impact that you're going to gain from the, from the event and activities that are taking place? We're right now undertaking from an innovation standpoint uh, a couple of new programs and one is to develop a scorecard that takes all four of those parts. The economic impact, um, the, the you know cost benefit analysis side, the resident community sentiment and, and the impact that it has on job creation and what it means to the community. And, and in, in talking to city council, they understand that better than they understand economic impact. When you walk in, as Tim will say, and he knows going into the Florida legislature down there, trying to explain economic impact is like speaking Greek to a bunch of Russians. I mean, they, they just don't get it. And but if you tell them that they got a ribbon cutting ceremony for a little league field, and it's gonna mean a lot to those 400 kids that are playing, they'll all show up for their picture taking. So the innovations are going to be diversification, diversification of how you measure success and what your definition is. And that's return on investment and return on mission. And we are now moving the needle on return on mission as much as we are return on investment. You can't deny return on investment, but that's that's what the barometer has been set for such a long time. But return on mission is extremely important going forward. The second is people are going to have to diversify their income sources. Um, you know, Terry and I have talked about membership as, as an income source. We talk about sponsorship, we talk about you know, can we charge fees to stage events? In many countries around the world, they have diversified income, but they also have their country or their, their, their region pay for the events. We don't have that luxury here in the U.S. DC is a granting organization of, of, of less than $10 million, which is small as it goes in the United States. But these other countries that produce events basically fund finance, and we don't do that here. With the change of what's going on, the diversification income is going to have to include other sources. And we will continue to develop new sources. We've got a number of programs we're going to roll out over the next few months that will be very interesting to our industry. We'll have a nominal effect on us, but we'll provide some resource, uh, financial resource opportunities for our membership because they're the ones that have to drive. The second thing Terry talked about is you know this 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 uh, kind of suffocation of the youth sports right now that's taking place with no activity. Yes, some are going into the esports, and esports, by the way, is they're just in the early stages of defining what that means. You know, is there tourism? How much? How mm -hmm. will it affect? But just by nature of the business itself, it's online, which does not make it one of those drivers for group gatherings. I'm a big group gathering guy, but virtual is going to be here to stay. Particularly, esports is going to be sorting out over the next few years. The, the financing, as Tim talked about, uh, without the main driver of income right now in our destinations, being able to finance bid fees and hosting fees and supplement with uh, reduced services uh, provided by the local municipality um, may, be, may be lost. So that means that there's going to have to be a business decision by event owners, by destinations, and by hoteliers as a, as a threesome staging the event. How do we stage the event? You know, we may have to, the de every event's uh, owner is going to have to decide uh, how, how do I come off those fees. I've been on some calls with some national major league sports who have been told that uh, that all-star game is not going to command a $5 million bid fee anymore. You, you may be lucky to get a million or less. And so the event owners are going to have to decide the economics of this. So you're going to see the supply chain uh, on the <laughs> participants be, be structured. So you're going to have to be innovative to continue the cottage industry we have in the United States to continue youth sports growing. 
You're going to have to reinvigorate the youth sports and re-engage them because there's going to be a drifting of people leaving the sports. And so we're going to have to have programs well integrated across the country to keep them or bring them back in. And that's going to fall on the shoulders of the uh, our, our governing bodies, our national governing bodies. The financing of events and activities and the financing of our destinations are, are critical. And finally, the definition of how we decide um, you know, what is the value of our, the intersection of community and commerce and how do we measure that value? I'll leave you with this one comment. You know, people ask me daily and my head has got flat spots from beating up every day talking to our, you know, probably 30, 40, 50 members a day. But there's three signs coming out of this and you can read all the signs you want. You can listen to opinions. I can, at least can tell me that, you know, they came up with a new vaccine, drinking Coca-Cola, whatever he's going to tell me. But there's three things you can look at here in the United States, quite frankly, and I believe it's the same around the world. In the United States, because of the way our government and constitution works, the states have control of, their, of, of how they interact. So state alignment in terms of openings have got to come together and there has to be some commonality around aligning to open up. The second factor is group gatherings have to be expanded to a reasonable enough number that in the tourism industry you have leisure and group, and those are the two prime groupings for income. Group for us are tournaments, and youth tournaments have to have the capacity and ability to have hundreds of thousands of people attend. So until we relax the restrictions around group gatherings, we're going to be we're going to be sputtering. And third, for us in the United States, high school sports have to be commonized again in the fall, in the regular seasons they were, because by shifting high school sports to to new seasons eliminates the ability for travel sports and high school sports to take place at the same time. Most states don't allow it, in fact. So those kids that are playing travel sports or, you know, pay to play sports, no longer are getting seen by colleges. And oh, by the way, the colleges who are recruiting those athletes won't be attending events because there won't be travel sports. And second, their season shifted so they won't be able to travel during their in season. Particular volleyball, for an example, is pretty much paralyzed next year because they're going to have a spring schedule. There's no travel. And they're not going to send uh, one of their coaches to go see something. So those three factors will be the lead indicators. If you're an economics person, you always look for lead indicators. Those three will tell you when we're opening. You can forget everything else. Those three all have to happen for us to open in any kind of robust way so that these guys can take the benefit of it in their in their location. Thank you, Al. Terry, um, would you go, go along with that? I mean, it, it's a... Uh... As you say, there's a lot of thought that needs going on. That, and that interesting thing about state alignment for me, you know, that uh, that is a challenge, isn't it? Particularly in the in the United States, to make sure that you are um, all on some sort of level footing and you all have that same kind of chance. Yes, uh, great question and great observation. I think that's one of the things that's been a unique challenge um, during this process is that each state is assessing the COVID environment extremely differently. Uh, and the latitudes that some states are providing that others aren't. And the fact that you have to do a, you know, a cross section of travel to get to some that allow you know, open play versus you know, those who are closed for play has been a unique obstacle to overcome. I mean, the states are putting, actually states are putting you know, parameters on who can and can't travel into each state because of you know, the, the, the caseload and, and specific states. And, you know, quarantining now down to 10 days versus 14 days, you know, is a help. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, who's monitoring, who's observing, who's, you know, who's, who's got the global oversight of all this? Because, um, I mean, we all know that if I got in my car right now and I drove up to New Jersey, who's really going to check me besides the, the toll collectors at, you know, the various, you know, booths up and around, you know, I-95? Well, no one. But I have to take a personal responsibility to know what is you know right for me and my family and right for us and you know even though the states are putting the overall arching you know perspective on all this it's still left to the individual to have to play a role in um, the importance of what is important right now and what is not important and i think that's having a, an effect on the, the sports landscape as a whole especially at the youth level um, because there are you know, the rambunctious, you know, go get them. I don't care what's in my way. We're going to play no matter what to the really conservative folks who are saying this is real. This is big. This is having an impact on our family. It's having an impact on our environment and we're not going to be the risk taker. Um, and people are having to make some challenging decisions um, in their personal lives. I mean, unemployment in this you know, United States is higher than it's been in a long, long time. 
people's fiscal resources. You know, parents used to drop a thousand bucks for a kid to play in a youth soccer league or a youth lacrosse league or whatever, no longer will have those resources for a period of time because they've tapped into their savings or they're you know, looking at refinancing their homes or whatever um, because mom or dad, it might be on the unemployment you know, perspective right now. So it goes back to, um, I believe what new, numerous people on this panel said, getting our local, you know, house in order is going to be critical, you know, to the expansion of the development of how the, the group travel and the leisure travel comes into market. Because if there's not a comfortability at the home front, it's hard to be welcoming people in providing that, um, that voice of comfort when it's not solid on, on the home territory. So I, I, I do communicate, and as Al alluded to, you know, at the state association level, we're trying to find um, commonalities amongst us. We're trying to find ways that we can drive conversations so that when we go to our legislatures or we have to go to our, our municipalities to have conversations, you know, I can use information that might be relevant to Florida or might be relevant to you know, Virginia or Pennsylvania and be able to talk about if we can find two or three commonalities, it would allow us to then expand our footprint of offerings. But until we can find those two or three commonalities, we got to continue to work as leaders in the space to continue the conversation, to grow those conversations and open the eyes of some people who, you know, right now, a lot of people are sitting in their various silos because that's where they're protected. You know, our job is to make sure that the information is crossing the silos so that we can have really firm conversations about, you know, how sports are important to especially at the youth level, social impact, you know, psychological impact, the physicality and the health and wellness, you know, just the participatory level of it is so critical, you know, but here we are, we're talking about the economic vitality of it, which is critical and it is very important. However, until we get the home front, the, you know, the foundation of the home front, right? You know, putting the clatter boards on with the external travel market is going to be a very challenging conversation to have over the next probably five to six months. And we can create all the return to play models, which we have here in the state of Maryland and, and, and the other things. But if we're not crossing those state lines and having those conversations at a high level, it doesn't matter, you know, what's going on in the market because we're not on a common footing. And so we have to find common footing. And I think and I appreciate Al and the, the other members of this panel for realizing that we have to find some commonality footings in order to make sure that this market has a place to grow and expand in the future. And, you know, how we articulate that and how we position that from a sports tourism and a sports event perspective is going to be critical. Um, to our future success. Let's go from Maryland to Florida. Uh, Lisa, to come to you first then. Uh, I mean, that, that is a very relevant point, isn't it? That, you know, you've got the situation there perhaps in the north. Um, how, how, how do you feel that you can bring the nation uh, together or will it always be this sort of state-led um, answer for you because uh, you know short, short of a new president coming up with a new way of running the country uh, you know it's, it's the system you have so how, how do you think it's going to work in terms of getting some kind of um, standification across the country well um, let me uh, I, I, I want to say you know Al in his probably most modest you know nature is not really mentioned the fact that you know the state uh, he leads an initiative through sports ETA which is the state association uh, organization which is where you know uh, leaders of different uh, state organizations you know, like like the, the Florida Sports Foundation and Terry you know all part of a continuous conversation which you know started a, a, a few years ago and kind of like intensified a little more um, this year with the challenges of COVID. You know that's already, in my opinion, such a start to at least get these people that are involved in in leading sports in their different uh, uh, destinations, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> in their different uh, states to start having some kind of a discussion and. With these uh, discussions, you know, uh, we start to find areas of commonalities. So there's healthy competition, right, in terms of planning these events and growing, you know, you know, your destination or your community. But the fact at the end of the day is, you know, it all boils down to success, successfully uh, putting these events together and, you know, and, and, and progressing and building the entire uh, landscape of the sports industry. 
you know, so that's kind of like a really uh, good angle to look at this. And I'm still going to throw <clears throat> a little more here on, on Al in the sense that, you know, when we, he's, he's, he's not putting together full, you know, education program, you know, academic programs in these directions, which is going to benefit probably, you know, the entire uh, uh, human resource community of the sports industry. In, in, in the United States, this is you know, sports tourism, like, of course, amateur sports and, and, and professional sports together. You know, so that's, that's kind of like a good way uh, of, of looking at it from a, from a first standpoint. And secondly, uh, when we start to look at, you know, and now this part, I may mean, have to just, you know, bring it down to the state of Florida because there might be something that might be general copy. I am definitely not in a better place than Al is, you know, to talk from a national perspective, you know, but... Um, on, on the Florida side, you know, there's a few a few things we're starting to look at. We we're starting to get together. We're huddling up every uh, every month. You know, from a state standpoint, we have our virtual you know uh, uh, conference. We we, we, we kind of talk. We 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 uh, discuss. You know, before we had you know four face to face conferences in a year. Um, uh, sorry, roundtable. So we will physically meet and you know, chat about what's going on in our communities, the industry, and what we have to together now because of you know covid and everyone's now moved to the virtual space you know i our offices were still operating from home you know we, they started since march and i think it's going to run to the end of the year this is already the end of the year um you know we are around to the conversations are now every month virtually where we try to bring together we try to bring together our partners you know bring in you know some uh, rights holders who can now from a distance, you know, talk to us about what events they have going on and introducing that to our partners. You know, one of the things we're also doing is, you know, we're introducing, we introduced our, 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 our monthly newsletter, you know, uh, obviously inspiration and giving things like Ask Our Kids Corner, you know, Kids Corner, who we put out all the time. Um, now we, we kind of like, you know, put what's happening within our community in that box, you know, to share with our with our partners. Um, still on the trends. Now we would, you would, we've also realized that, and, and I think Terry mentioned it briefly, is there is there is going to be some kind of difference between indoor events and outdoor events, right? You know, as far as COVID goes, there's the stakes are very different. Uh, obviously, um, generally when we started coming back into events, there was more emphasis on events that are outdoor. You know, and then gradually indoor events started uh, coming in with a little more restriction, but it was a lot easier, you know, to, um, you know, to focus a little bit more on outdoor events versus indoor events. And I think that's a trend that, um, that has been, you know, uh, witnessed nationally. And uh, I think this is also good. And hopefully, you know, one of the things we always, we would continue. And I think the country as a whole is starting to open up with this as well. You know, meeting face to face at our different you know sports conferences. Uh, I think this week um, there is U.S. Sports Congress that's taking place in Vegas, and I know a couple of other destinations that are attending that conference. And I think next month, you know, uh, uh, there's another conference in Myrtle Beach, uh, which is um, uh, uh, U, uh, U.S. Ex sports Exchange. So I think. Um, these are kind of like the scenarios before we we're going to go into sports ETA coming in. Uh, uh, towards uh, the, the, the first quarter of this coming year. You know, I think from this perspective, uh, obviously Florida definitely aligns itself with uh, initiatives from a national, from a nation standpoint, and we continue to look at things in that direction. Okay, Lisa, thank you for that. Um, Tim, just before I come to you, I'm just going to say to all the panel that what I'd like you to think about as we head towards the, uh, the close of our allotted time, but we'll perhaps finish by thinking about the one thing that that perhaps as, as, we, as we hope towards 2021 the one thing that is most likely to deliver sort of recovery uh for you personally you know for your sport for your state um so maybe you want to give some thought to that but tim just with you i'd like to pick up on something that lisa and and to some extent terry and al have both been saying about partnerships we haven't talked about uh, that too much but how important during this period um and again certainly looking forward is the support 
for you of partners because it's been a difficult time for everybody especially in the corporate world hasn't it we've talked about the aviation industry but certainly the tourism the hotels and everybody else everybody has has suffered so um how can good partnerships play its uh, play a role in delivering a recovery in the in the events sport and events business for you it, it's more critical than ever and i think that's an obvious statement uh and, and, and I'll tie that into something I was going to address when you're, you were just talking with the other panels about governance. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a recovering lawyer, so I fall back a little bit on my legal background. But yeah, we, you know, Al's completely right here that you know our country was formed on the basis of states' rights. You know, our federal government's a government of limited uh, governance rights. And, and what we've seen in this pandemic is sort of passing everything down from the federal level to state level to local level, and nothing's consistent. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to govern, right? It's hard to govern these days. We're a, we're a country that's divided over a lot of things. And so, you know, um, I, I don't think I'm saying something that's um, not observed by the entire country, if you've been paying attention, that everything's politicized these days, you know, from wearing a mask to whatever. It's, um, so it's hard, I think, to get to that point of common governance but I do think there will be, and again, with Al's leadership at Sports ETA and the, at the state levels with Terry and Lise, that best practices will emerge from this uh, in a much tighter, better way for the entire sports industry, whether you're at the professional level, collegiate level, youth amateur. Um, I think that's the one thing that has emerged from this by talking to people, and Terry had talked about breaking down silos is, just understanding best practices and getting a sense of how people are dealing with this thing, because um, you know the the partnership question is again critical. And I'll go back to something that Al said about rights fees and other things. This is going to come down to risk spreading. It's going to be a matter of not only how do we partner with you in spreading financial risk, liabilities. Um, you know, that hasn't emerged yet either. You know, we, we haven't seen um, those types of situations yet where people are suing somebody over the fact that they got COVID by going to an event and they feel like somebody probably um, breached some sort of standard of conduct. And so, you know, spreading the risk means a lot of things um, going forward. But I do think that's why those partnerships of having candid conversation about what an event does mean to, for example, St. Pete Clearwater. We're a, we're a leisure destination that we like to attract sporting events that is uh, financially viable on its own, but we can convert those attendees to come back as a leisure traveler later on. So there's always a long-term vision with our sporting sports programming to make it uh, you know, something that's a direct impact on the short term, but long term, People get exposed to our destination. They love it. They want to come back and visit while they're not attending a sporting event. Um, so, yeah, I, I think spreading that risk from a sales financial standpoint, from an event management standpoint, you know, how do you partner better with uh, with facilities? And so, yeah, I, again, I, I, I do think there's opportunity coming out of this thing to better ourselves. And I do think it's going to be a different landscape with uh, not only the number of events that are out there, and I, I think maybe Al or Terry, Terry said this earlier, that I think you're going to see consolidation uh, of certain events because, again, it, it, some of these event organizers that maybe are used to a certain level of financial support, that support may not be there anymore. Um, it's just a matter of fact that if we're trying to fund the same number of events coming back and we've got 50% of our revenue to do it, it's just not the economic uh, okay. equation just doesn't work out. The math isn't there. So. I do think having those discussions with who you can partner and how you can partner is going to be a lot different. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Let's start a bit of a roundup then. Al, I'll come back to you and I'll give you the last word because I know Sports CTA has had a lot of quite quite rightly a lot of wordy praise, but uh, we'll we'll give you the opportunity to sum up for us all. But Terry, so we'll start with you just on that one uh, about you know if there was one thing. Uh, that would sort of pull all this together and deliver uh, a really positive change in 2021. What do you think that might be? Uh, leadership and communication, I think, are just at the forefront of it all. Um, without those two things working in concert, uh, the rest of it's a moot point. Um, we need our leaders 
um, that the city, state, federal levels all communicating up through in, in our industry through Sport ETA, making sure that we're creating commonalities and, and principles that we all can live by because um, at the end of the day, if I leave Maryland to go to Florida, for example, I need to know there's some consistency of, you know, level of care, level of expectation and, and outcome. So leadership and communication are the, you know, one-two punch for me. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Lise, what would you say for, for this? Oh, absolutely. I want to start by first really just agreeing with what Terry is saying there. You know, that's you know, trickle down effect. It starts up there solid and now trickles down to everyone. But um, my one word which I want to use is diversification, right? You know, diversity and diversification, which kind of falls in a few different things. You know, the first one would be diversity of thought, of thought you know, diversification mm -hmm. of thinking and mentality. And I think we're already doing it in one way or the other here. So every actor, every stakeholder in the sports industry, you know, we need to start thinking about how we diversify our mindset. You know, this can go into, Tim just mentioned, and Al did that consolidation of, you know, of, of events, of sports, of sporting events, and mixing up the events, maybe, you know, cycling, uh, partnering up with another type kind of organization that can deliver the same event to maximize the, the chances, you know. Diversification of processes, you know, we want to think about maybe now restructuring the qualifiers or the qualifications for particular programs, you know, not, you know, uh, qualifications of venues and venue guides and stuff. Most importantly as well, you know, diversification of finance, of, of financing. You know, Al mentioned that earlier, you know, that's also something that's very, very important. And of course, last one, I would think it's, you know, <clears throat> we need to be able to try how we would measure execution of this event. So I think that, it's very important for us to have this flexibility in terms of, um, you know, how we diversify our mentality, our financing, our processes going into 2021. Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Tim, we'll, uh, we'll come to you. you. You've heard some of the thoughts. What, what, what are yours about? What's the one single area, if you were back in your lawyer's uh, outfit and was, was sort of summing up the case for the prosecution or the defence, uh, what would it be? The jury's still out. Um, I, I, I think I think it's really about, and I agree with everything that's just been said. But I, I would pick up on balancing priorities, right? You you, you just got to understand what your new priorities are. I mean, um, uh, to steal a line from one of the new Bruce Springsteen lines, you know, there's everybody working the same line. Well, that line's changing. You know, that line is no longer the same line. And so, what does that mean uh, in the community of uh, sports? promotion, sports programming, you know, um, again, we've got some advantage where we are and the fact that we are just a great leisure destination. So we have an attractive, you know, element there. When I was at Disney's Wild with the sports opening up, you know, what a great thing to sell Disney, you know, and, and so when you got a brand behind you, so so our, our situation is a lot different than maybe another sports commission that, you know, is a nice uh, smaller location maybe, but they're off beach. And so, you know, what is it that's attractive about that certain location, all things being equal? But I would say balancing your priorities would be something that has got to be a focus. And, 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 a, and again, both on the short term and long term. Yeah. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Al, we promise you the last word. So uh, the stage is yours, sir. But uh, yeah, what are you, you've heard what everybody's said. And uh, I'm sure, you know, you, those would all be part of the thoughts that you would have yourself. No pressure, Al. Yeah, yeah. Asking a lawyer for a single phrase is always a tough, uh, tough hey, thing. Hey, 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 Al. Come on. <laughs> it's paid by the word. <laughs> you know, look, I, I spent a lifetime. My vocation was advertising and persuasion, and I spent a lifetime. And Terry, Terry, Terry started the conversation out correctly in saying that through crisis, there's silver linings, and people are trained to look for silver linings or, or complain and look for you know the problems. And right now, we're we're at a point that, in order to increase the user experience. The, kind of the word I came up with was, uh, or the phrase is intelligent, flexible innovation, uh, because it, it encompasses leadership, it encompasses diversity, but the challenges we're gonna be faced with are, are, are immense, and they're across a wide spectrum of, of things that uh, have never before happened. The, the un, unemployment and employment is, is really under stress. The supply chain that leads up to the ability to have a tourism industry, to have a hotel business, to have an airline industry is challenged. And that's not appear, apparently coming back for some time. The funding by the, the resource funding to sustain as it once was is going to be different. So we're entering into a stage we've never been before because there's been unlimited funding and growth. So 
this innovation is going to be extremely important. And if you have a lack of leadership, innovation doesn't necessarily follow. And sustainability, you know, how, how do we sustain the cottage businesses that drive our, the, the and fuel the, our industry from the bottom up? And that, that it continues for years in the in the in the in the future, and then finally, how do we measure success? Every one of these aspects of our business is going to be challenged, and if you don't have the right kind of leadership, you're not diversified in your approach, you're not looking at different kinds of funding, and you're not flexible and innovative, you're going to be left behind. Those people today that are advertising, marketing, and getting out there, even though they may not be hosting events, it's proven in advertising and persuasion that you will gain market share on the back end. These are conversations I'm having with my international partners and the different associations I'm member uh, on the board of. And there's a commonality around the world and it's refreshing to know that. Uh, the unique thing we have in the United States is we got a wacky president right now. And so we, we don't know where things are going, uh, but, but there's hope. And I'm hoping that there's intelligent, flexible innovation coming from uh, our leadership, both on a federal, national and local level. So thank you so much for hosting this from our perspective. You know, the, these three are friends. These three guys are friends of mine. The great example of the kind of people we have leading our association and um, uh, you at ISC, you and Nigel, a Andrew are, and Oscar are uh, uh, really a, a terrific to be able to take the time uh, to listen to us uh, kind of dribble on here in the United States. So thank you so much for the opportunity. No, far from it, Al. It's been fascinating for me. I've been involved in the sports industry for 40 years myself in, in sports broadcasting and sports journalism. Um, but to absolutely listen to, to guys like you at the heart of it all and uh, to share the common experience between, uh, I'm, I'm here representing the UK and Europe, but I mean, the world in general, you know, shares the problems that you, you're talking about there in the US. And we wish you all the very best for, for 2021. And thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Lise. And, uh, and to you, Al, for, uh, for a great thank session. Thank you very much much.